Hello and welcome to Victory On Demand. We hope that the message you're about to watch helps you, inspires you, and challenges you in some way that helps you take your next step. We want to connect with you and we know that life is busy and that you may be watching this on maybe a Tuesday afternoon or a Saturday morning or some other day of the week that isn't Sunday. And that's the beauty of On Demand, uh, that, that God can use any of the other 167 hours of the week to connect us back to Him. But we want to be able to include you as part of our church family and to help take you to your next step, wherever that may be. So let us know that you're here by clicking that button that's popping up on your screen right now. No matter who you are, where you are, or, or what you're struggling with, our goal is to equip you with a new perspective that will give you a better way to do life. And we pray that as you live out God's word, that you would truly experience something more, something better. If you haven't experienced a live Victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.live for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. We're so glad that you've chosen to be a part of Victory today, and we hope that you enjoy this message. This is a divine rescue. The foundation of our faith is the nail-scarred, resurrected feet of Jesus. The church's mission is to connecting people back to Him, whatever it takes. A lot of times in communities, we look to churches and different organizations and we reach out and say, how can you help us? But you know, here at this church, you guys do the reaching out. And I'm just gonna tell you, Franklin Schools would miss you dearly. Church makes a huge difference. Uh, what if God was commanding you to do something, but I never told you about it? Have you ever thought about that? Like, hey, what if there was actually something that I am doing that I know about, but I talk to you all the time, and I, but I, and I get to see God move in my life, but I just kept all of that for me. Like, what if there was something in your life that God wanted you to experience, but from my perspective, I refuse to tell you about it? What, what if that was true? If that was true, could I be actually considered a trusted spiritual advisor? Could I be considered a biblical teacher, a mentor in any way? I mean, have you really ever thought about that? What if God was actually commanding you to do something, but the people up here never told you about it? And the crazy thing is, is that is exactly what everyone hopes I do when it comes to a particular subject, a subject of money. Now, if this is your first time here, I'm so glad you're here. And uh, we don't do this all of the time. In fact, next week, we're kicking off a brand new series called Under, the, Under These Circumstances, talking about difficult circumstances. And if you're part of Victory and you missed the, la I want you to miss the last couple of weeks, I'll let you go back and watch that online because these talks go together. But today I'm getting pretty straightforward. So uh, I'd love for you to hear me in context of the last two weeks. But the reality is, is I cannot be considered a trusted spiritual advisor without telling you what God has to say about money. And the reality is, is I actually hate talking about this. But if you're a Jesus follower, you already know that Jesus talked about money and our fascination of money and our love of money more than he talked about faith and salvation or prayer or heaven or even hell. 
I mean, just read the New Testament. 11 of the 39 parables, Jesus talks about money. One out of every seven verses of, of Jesus's words, it talks about money. But if I never talked about it, then I would not be helping you follow Jesus. And the reason this makes such a, a big, Jesus makes such a big deal about generosity and caring for the world around us isn't because he's after our wallet. No, it's because he's after our, our heart. And so this is about trusting God and experiencing God and depending God and responding to God in this life. Now, if you're on the sidelines of faith, here's what I would love for you to realize, that the American brand of Christianity is actually so much different than the original version of Christianity. Like there, there are some churches and some preachers that use the subject of money to guilt and manipulate people. Some, people, pr some preachers promise things that Jesus never said, but at Victory, I, I promise to never guilt or manipulate but if you feel convicted at all, that's actually the Holy Spirit's role in our lives. All of that to say, hey, if you're skeptical of the church, I'll stand in line with you. Me too, honestly. But I also would love for you to realize that the original version of Christianity was marked, was changed, was, was moved by people's sacrificial generosity. I mean, just forget the Bible, just historically speaking. I mean, Jesus' followers in history have been the most progressive, sacrificial, compassionate, innovative, loving, generous people in the entire world. And their sacrifice changed the world as we know it. Their generosity was a mark of their discipleship because Jesus told them, this world is not your home. And so they invite, and then he invites his followers to store up for themselves treasures in heaven so they did not let what they wanted immediately to affect what they wanted e eternally. But when we come to church, we just hope he never talks about it. I hope he never mentions it. In fact, one of the complaints I hear most at the church, maybe you've heard this, is all the church wants is my money. Have you heard that? Maybe you've said that before. I'm glad you're here if you have, but all the church wants is my money. But when that is said, what, what is really implied is simply this, that the church, or, or the church is not a building, it's made up of the people. The people of the church, they don't actually care about you. They haven't poured into your kids or grandkids. No one here got up early to serve you or open a door for you or sacrifice for you or teach your kids for you. Like the, the church is just like Netflix or cheer or travel or sports or Walmart or Disney. They just want my money. And when you hear that, what is actually communicated is, is, is they've never seen a church actually sacrificially serving the needs of their community. They've probably never seen a church provide camp experiences for the next generation or marriage seminars for, or, or extra training classes. The church has never given out food or helped third world countries. The church has never done anything to stop sex trafficking or help women in crisis with pregnancies or newborn babies or foster kids. They, they never teach people about God or mentor people in the faith or walk with people when they mess up to bring them back up. They never pray for people. They never give advice. They, they don't really care. No, all they want is my money. And, and when that is said, just think about it for a second. That person probably hasn't given. And so that means that everything I just mentioned, we were willing to do for them for free. But you know this, and the truth is, the reality is, is we can't do any of that for, for free. I mean, every organization needs money to survive, but the, our goal of victory isn't to make a profit. It's to make a difference. And the reality is the only way that we can do any of the things I just listed is because someone gave. Someone here is, is generous and so that we can serve and care for the people who are not here yet, maybe not even born yet. And so the reason we get all skeptical and the reason that we get all touchy when it comes to this particular subject is the truth is it is unnatural. I mean, remember back in week one where I said, hey, the church is the only body that exists for the benefit of its non-members. This is unnatural. And to say the church just wants my money is actually a defense mechanism for you and I to not trust God. I mean, you don't even have to follow Jesus. Just look at your everyday life experience. The truth is every day, every one of us spends our money on things without complaining. We just spend it on the things we truly value. And but we have an enemy causing doubt, confusion, and fear on what would happen if we actually trusted God. This is a real spiritual battle. And it was never more apparent to me than last month 
with all of the devastation and the hurricanes down south. And I just want you to know as a church, we, we gave to help people on the front lines there. But here's the reality. So did the whole nation. All of that to say, hey, if this church was going under, and it's not, but if this church was going under, no one else would give to it. No, we, we would just be another statistic of the 7,000 churches in America that close every year. 140 churches in every state every year close. So if we're not willing to be generous here, no one will. We won't make the news. There won't be a GoFundMe for victory. If we're not willing to be generous here, no one will. And here's what I believe. What we're doing is eternally important. Now, now, hear me, I do not mean to undermine the true devastation that happened down south, but I just need to remind all of us that the church was given a mission to change eternity. We're talking about eternal souls. They should be way more important to us than temporary housing. That's why Jesus, our leader, Jesus, our savior, Jesus uh, sent you and I on this rescue mission of connecting people back to God. So Jesus, he addresses all of this on his most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And he says this, no one, no one can serve two masters. You will either hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. And then Jesus says these divisive words. You cannot serve both God and what? Money. You have to choose. But by the way you and I talk about money, the way we get defensive when it comes to our money, saying, hey, the church just wants my money, it pushes our hearts and our kids away from the church. All of this leads me to ask this very offensive question. Is the way that we talk about money teaching our children to hate God? Now, before you start arguing with me, here's what I mean by that. By the way we speak about money in the car, at the restaurant, in the grocery store, just pause, reflect, listen to your words. Evaluate what they hear. I can't believe the price of gas. I can't believe the price of groceries. Honey, stop spending money on that. I don't know where it's gonna come from. Have you been talking about money? Like, by the way you talk about it, money, do your children hear you talk about that more than your dependence on God? Full transparency, I do this. But when we do this, we're, we're teaching our children to hate God. Why? Because scripture teaches when it comes to God and money, you, you can love one, but you have to hate the other. And so when the rubber meets the road by our ongoing ranting and anxiety and fear surrounding money, in reality, what we're really communicating to our kids, hey kids, hey, there's only one thing that you can count on in this life to take care of our family. So put your faith and hope in money, not God. Now, pray all you want. Show up to church all you want. That's good. Hey, but at the end of the day, you better go out and make some money. Right? Because money is the only thing that can solve all of our problems. So we can't depend on God, trust God, follow God, and count on God to take care of us. Now, the reality is none of us meant to do that. No one here is trying to communicate that, but I have done that so many times. And what's especially convicting to me is my stress over money isn't that God wouldn't or couldn't provide for me. Now, the reality is all my financial problems are because without consulting God, I made some stupid financial decisions and overstepped my financial boundaries and I put my family at risk by buying stuff I couldn't afford. And the terrible thing is that some of the stuff I didn't even need, but I bought it anyway. No one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and, and money. And that's why when you and I come to church, we hate talks on, on money. It reveals our heart. It reveals our dependence. Now, let's not make this a religious thing, right? Let's just pretend you don't love God, right? You just got up early. Just make it all practical. Here, here's a question. If chasing money really made any of our lives better, we would be experiencing it, right? Right? Like in your everyday experience, if chasing money really actually made your life better, I feel less anxiety. I love it. We would be experiencing it, right? Because with all of our focus on our money, we should feel better. No, instead of we chase money and we still have anxiety. We chase money and we still have arguments about it. In fact, money is the number one argument in every marriage and the number one cause of divorce. So we don't have a money problem. We have a heart problem. 
God wants our heart. God wants us to cast all of our anxieties on him. God wants us to come to him and depend on him, but we are fighting for control. Now, in Luke 12, Jesus talks about this whole thing from a different perspective. He says, then he, Jesus, said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And I read that and thought, there's more than one kind? Apparently. Jesus says, all kinds. Yeah, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. And then he says, life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Check out your garage, right? And then he told them this parable which is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. So he thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. So take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. And he thought all of that that God, that God had blessed him for with, with, was for him to consume. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you, which sounds harsh. But in reality, you and I never have control over when we die. And then Jesus asked this paralyzing question. Then who will get what you prepared for yourself? So you worked really hard. You saved your whole life, but you were, you were saving it for you, but you will die one day. And when you die, who will get everything that you've prepared for yourself? And then if you follow Jesus, he makes this scary statement. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. You won't be generous towards God until you take care of yourself first. Now, this is how it happens to us practically. Because in our 20s, <laughs> we don't have anything. Uh, you can lose everything you own in your 20s. You'd be out like 500 bucks, like, <laughs> And so, so you'll be like, I'll start trusting God in my 30s. Then when you get to your 30s, you're like, kids are way more expensive than I thought, right? And, and then you think, oh, well, I'll, I'll give when I get a promotion. And then you're in your 40s and you're like, I've got kids college. I've got to retire. I, no matter what age or stage you are, if you don't start now, there will always be a new excuse. But Jesus says, hey, this is how it'll be. With whoever stores up for themselves, but is not rich towards God. Now, I know what you're thinking. (laughs) How can we make it? Will God show up? This seems unwise. Jesus knows that. He says, then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, because of all that, I tell you, do not worry about your life or what you will eat or what your body or, or about your body or what you will wear. Jesus knows the anxiety around this whole thing. He says, trust me, you will have everything you need and most of what you want. You don't need to worry. And then it reminds us for life, and when he says that, he means your life is more than food and the body more than clothes. And then Jesus has ADHD. I, I, this is how I picture it. Like, look at the birds, right? So that's why is there's something, a bird swooping down. He says, look, consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. God does all of that for them, and he wants to do all of that for us. And then Jesus reminds us again of his view of you and how much more what? Valuable you are than the birds. You are more important to me, Jesus says, so trust me. And then he says something that even skeptical people have experienced. I just just imagine he says it in a loving tone. Who of you, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? God says, hey, you worry about this stuff all the time. You talk about this stuff in front of your kids all the time and you feel better right? You have more time in your day, right? No. Why? You're trying to do God's job. And Jesus says, since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? And then this next section is for all the fashionistas and the online shoppers. He says, consider how the wildflowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon, the richest guy you could think of, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these And if that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you? And then he gets to the heart of the issue. He says, you of little what? Faith. And you do not set your heart. It's a heart issue. Do not set your heart on what you will eat or what you will drink. Do not worry about it. And then he says these gunt-wrenching words for the pagans. When we do this, we're no different than the people who don't even believe in God. He says, the pagan world runs after all such things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. 
Now, I don't know about you, but if I just truly leaned into that, like, hey, you know, you see the bill, you see the empty refrigerator, like, what, would, wouldn't that just change your anxiety if you believe that your loving heavenly father, that he, he knows? And then Jesus says, your heavenly father knows that you need them. And then Jesus commands his followers what to do when the world seems out of control. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Don't be overwhelmed by all of the stuff in your life. Uh, You will get food. You will get clothes. Your heavenly father has promised he's going to take care of you. All you have to do is seek him first. Now, the point of this whole parable is simply this. If you don't seek him first, it does not matter what you seek second. If you don't seek him first, it doesn't even matter what you seek second. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. And then Jesus, who knows that they're gonna struggle with this idea of trusting him, says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And then he says, sell your possessions. Now, maybe the reason you're so stressed out is because you actually don't need a boat payment. Maybe you don't actually need three trips to Disney. Maybe you don't actually need the newest gadget on the market. In fact, for so many, so, so many, the reason you aren't giving is not because you don't want to. No, it's because you don't actually own your possessions. They own you. You don't have any margin. So Jesus says, hey, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses or, or treasure for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. And then Jesus says these convicting words, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, let me freak you out even a little bit more. You you ready for that? So Jesus follower or not, uh, have you ever even actually considered how much of your life you can actually control? Like, have you ever like really thought about that? How much of my life do I actually have control of? And the reality is very little. In fact, I made a list this week of things we have no control over. You ready? Weather, no control over that. Natural disasters, traffic, wish I could. Gas prices, economy, cats, zero control over cats. War, famine, who your parents are, right? Your family, the dysfunction in your family, death can't control that. Teenagers definitely can't control what others say, what others do, what others think about me, can't control that. Your future, your past, a temper, wow, a toddler's temper tantrum, your race, your birthday, a doctor's report, your receding hairline or going gray. So you can try to grow it out or cover it up, but you can't control it right? We don't have any control. No matter how tightly we hold on to this life, we really don't have much control of this life. And so Jesus says, hey, trust me to protect you. Depend on me to provide for you. You're, let your loving heavenly father who sent his son to die for you, well, just let him guide you. Now, for so many, the idea of sacrificial giving is, is actually brand new to them. But to the people that Jesus was actually talking to in that moment, they were used to it. So in churches all across America, when they talk about giving, they'll look at the Old Testament and they'll talk about tithing and tithing equals 10%. But here's what they don't tell you. That was just part of it. They had the the temple tithe. That's all recorded in scripture. Then there's actually another tithe. Uh, This was the the next tithe was the festival or the rejoicing tithe. They, They paid that tithe too. So if you're doing the math, that's 20% that the Israelites were commanded to set aside. And then on top of all of that, they gave an offering of three to 5% for the poor or a charity offering on top of all of that, meaning Jesus was speaking to people who were commanded to give a roughly 25% of their income or they would be kicked out. I don't know about you, but 25%, that sounds a lot. But if you're a Jesus follower, it's actually worse than that. In the New Testament, Jesus demands 100% of us. Jesus' followers believe that Jesus so loved us that he laid down his life for us, uh, for, for our life, for our eternal life, that so 100% of us lives for him. That means that he doesn't just want Sunday mornings. He wants to be the God of our entire week. That we, and we're not just talking about money. We're talking about our, our whole lives. So 100% of our lives is for him, that we're actually stewards of the life that he has given us. So everything we own, is actually his to which you say, Josh, I work hard. Absolutely you do. But who gave you the ability to work? Who protected you to put you in the position that you're in? Who had you living in America? Now, even if you're skeptical 
You have to be honest. There's actually so much of your life that you don't have control of anyway. No, you and I are stewards of the life that God has given us. So 100% of me is, is his. And then God allows us to steward our time, our talent, and our treasure. Now, when it comes to generosity in the New Testament, Scripture commands some things for the Jesus followers. We're supposed to give in response to a need in a systematic and purposeful manner, in a sacrificial way that cost us, a secret and humble way, and in a cheerful way. That's the commands. That's what Jesus in the New Testament commands about our sacrificial generosity. And at Victory, the good news is this year is 83% of us, of the households, have given. That, that's great. That's better participation than we have in groups. Like that's right. But, but we started the journey. Now, last week, I just challenged you. I know no matter where you are, land on this whole pathway of generosity right here, would you just consider taking the next step? Because as a church, we're, giving, we're, we're receiving only 86% of what we've budgeted, to which you would say, well, the budget's too high. Just so you know, we're evaluating everything. But if everyone keeps doing what we are doing, so many parts of this ministry that everybody loves eventually won't be able to happen because we won't be able to fund certain things. Now, we are right now a part of the 7% of churches in America that are actually reaching people far from God. But to continue our mission, we, we need your involvement to which you say, Josh, just cut back what we have. And the problem is with a church our size isn't that we're overspending. In fact, let me just tell you where we stack up nationally. Nationally, our church is among the top 2% in the U.S. congregations by size. Two, top 2%. For a church our size in 2023, we had the second highest baptism rate in, in the country. So we're on the cutting edge nationally. But if you were just to go, okay, what's the national average for, for generosity? Uh, not the top 5%, just the, the national average. We, our budget would be $1.9 million. We'd be able to use that as fuel for, for the mission here. But because of where we've been financially, our leadership team approved on a budget of one6 and to, to date, we're collectively only giving 1.4, which means uh, that, that we've got to really uh, reevaluate some things. We, we've had three full-time people who either are retiring or seeking new opportunities that we won't be able to replace. Now, the crazy thing is, is if you, if you were to go to the households here at Victory, just the households, they were committed to tithing. And I went and looked at the census data and take the number of our households in our church. If the households of our church tithe, we would raise 2.9 million as fuel for the kingdom. I mean, think about the community involvement. Think about the opportunity. Think about what God could do in and through our church if we were just doing that. In fact, I don't want to get all political but the reason the government has to start all of these programs for the people who desperately need it is because the church in America is not doing its job. Now, as I've looked at our budget, there is an area where we could actually do a really a lot better job. I've discovered a $30,000 line item, $30,000 that we are giving away to credit card companies because they need it. I mean, because we're paying a percentage on the processing fees uh, when it comes to, so the one thing that you could do right now and actually not ch even change the amount you give is if you take this little paper that's in the bulletin there and, and you could give the same amount, but just change the way you give to an ACH or, or just uh, send it uh, to your bank account like you pay your other bills instead of doing on a credit card or a debit card. That, that would be huge. So if you have problems with setting that up, Andrew should be out the connection desk out there and he can help you do that. Now, when it comes to money, uh, there's a loophole in the Bible, like finally, some good news, right? There, there's a, the stingy Christians, they look for a loophole in the Bible and they try to use it, a reason not to trust God in this area of their life. And here, here's the verse, they found a verse to which you are like, okay, let's, let's go. What's the verse? It's 2 Corinthians chapter nine. And it says, each of you should, should give what you have decided in your heart to give. So I've just decided not to give very much, not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. And that is 100% true, that is. If your heart has been changed by Jesus, if your heart has been wrecked by the grace of God, but if not, I can find you another verse that actually says your heart is, de is deceitful above all things and beyond a cure. So if your heart has not been wrecked and changed by the, the blood of Jesus, here's the reality. Without even trying, all of us would naturally drift towards selfishness and greed. That's just natural. 
And so you need to know that this doesn't happen in every church. There's a lot of bad churches out there. But in our church, I give. I was talking to a young couple this week that Becky and I give more now than our first mortgage payment. And I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you, leaders go first. And so, so we give, our ministerial staff gives, our leadership team gives. So we're not asking you to do anything that we aren't ourselves doing. And full transparency, Becky is way more generous than I am. And also full transparency, we didn't start out our marriage giving. So let me just give you a little thing about what changed. So often we fill up our lives and there's, there's so many things in our life, but there's all these other good things that we wanna put in our life as well, like work or sports or food or good things like social media, like, right? And then we just try to add Jesus later, but he doesn't fit. And so we're like, okay, Jesus, you can wait over there till Sunday. Because here's the reality is order determines capacity. Order determines capacity. Because you know this, we've got to do this. Right? And then we walk around and in our life and then something feels like it's missing. Why? It's because we haven't put in first. Remember what we read, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and then all of these things will be given to you as well. See, what Jesus promises is that when you and I prioritize God with the first 10% of our income, that he goes first. Then God promises that, that he's gonna deliver us and redeem us and bless us with the other 90% that he, he gives us, more than if we kept it all for ourselves. And that it all fits. There's room left over. But you'll never know until you try. So many will settle for the math ain't mathin'. Like, I don't see how God could or would do that or would, how it could be true for me. So you won't try, which only means you will never experience the blessing of God in this area of your life that stresses so many of us out. See, anyone can give. The discipline can tithe. But being generous requires faith and trust in God to provide. And just so you know, I don't have a dog in the fight. Like if you tithe or not, I don't have a dog in the fight. My salary does not go up or down based off of people's tithes, right? Your obedience to God in this area of your life does not affect my paycheck. There's two reasons I'm teaching you this. Number one is God loves you. And number two, I, I love you and I want you to live under blessing. I don't want you to, to live under the financial stress and pressure that I have actually lived under before. And so... What if God was commanding you to do something, but I just never told you about it? The reality is God doesn't need your money, but he wants your heart. He wants your dependence. He wants your devotion. In fact, when you open up the New Testament, if you look at the life of a disciple, a Jesus follower, here's something that's true is it takes time. So no matter where you are on this pathway of generosity, there's no shame where you start. But if you follow Jesus, you need to find a way to put him first. And tithing is a real tangible way where you feel the sting every you know, month, or a tangible reminder that the blood of Jesus, that he, he, he gave his firstborn son, that God rescued me and provided for me and took, me, took away my sin from me. So now I can have faith that he's gonna continue to rescue me and provide for me and deliver me and take care of me. And so I just gotta put him first. Why don't you go ahead and grab the above and beyond cards. They're right here. We have two opportunities. There's in the chair right in front of you there. The $39 opportunity that we're asking every adult to be a part of November 22nd. We're gonna give all that money away to feed and care for the most vulnerable in our community. And the second opportunity is the one-time sacrificial gift at the end of the year, December 22nd, where we as a church stretch ourselves to give in ways that are sacrificial to advance the mission of victory. I understand. It takes time. You might have to rearrange some things. I had two conversations this uh, last week. One said as a text message, message received. We're going to reprioritize our finances, uh, but it's going to take a month. So in 2025, God's going to be first. Uh, another was a young couple and they just got married. And she, this girl's 22 years old. And she says to me what no 20 year old says ever. She says, Josh, we have it so much better than my parents. And I was like, I didn't know what she was talking about. Uh, but I was like, so, so what are you talking about? She says, we don't have a lot of hope bills or obligations. So my husband and I can start off our marriage by putting God first. And I was blown away. 
Uh, now, if, if you struggle with the whole idea of this, I, I get it. In fact, the Israelites could say, me too. I mean, in fact, the book of Exodus, Moses shares that when God freed them from Egypt, he parted the Red Seas, he provided for them, protected them, he delivered them. And so they were eyewitnesses and recipients of God's deliverance. But in Joshua chapter three, there was a barrier between them and God's promise. Quite literally, the Jordan River was between them and, and the promised land. And God, he gave them a promise, but there was a barrier. He says, then the priests will carry the ark of the Lord. And here's what the Lord, of the, the, the Lord of the whole earth, as soon as the priests step into the Jordan, it will stop flowing. Now I read that and thought, well, why God, didn't God do it like he did at the Red Sea? Why didn't he just part it before? Why didn't God just bless them and deliver them and save them like he did before where they, where they didn't have to move, they just walked in his blessing. And then I realized this time it was about something different. It was about trusting God. In fact, Josh records that that's how you will know that the living God is among you. And so when it comes to God's deliverance and when it comes to God's provision, when it comes to God's involvement in our life, we think, why doesn't he keep moving? But his goal is to grow your faith, grow my faith. And if the Israelites never took that next step, they'd be trapped outside of the promised land. If they would have held back or where they were frozen with fear, they would have missed out on the promise of God. But Joshua records, the priests came to the river and their feet touched the water's edge. Can you imagine this massive roaring river and your toes are soaked and you're like, God, are you gonna move? God, if you don't show up, I'm gonna drown. God, if you don't show up, I'm gonna look stupid. God, if you don't show up, my family's in trouble. But the priests came to the river and their feet touched the water's edge and right away, the water uh, coming down from the river stopped flowing. See, our God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And back then it was about trust. And today it's really about trust. And even though we've seen God move in the past, and even though we've seen his faithfulness in our lives, we have to keep trusting. We've got to keep praying. We've got to keep being willing to take that first step because we know that God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. Would you stand and join us as we sing? Because I see miracles. I seen the lost give out. You pulled me from the darkness, set my feet on solid ground, and I will testify that this life is not my own. I owe it all to my God, who will never let me go. Declare these truths together. I will testify that 
Just like the Israelites trusted God, you and I are called to trust God and take some sacrificial next steps, praying that He's gonna show up, praying that He's gonna move in our life and be involved in our life, and uh, keep praying that, that our sacrifices will impact eternity. Uh, that, it, that when we are generous here, it's fuel for the mission of connecting people back to God. So God is moving here, uh, but it's gonna take all of us to take the next step. Here, here's what I know, alone, I can't do very much, but together we can make a difference that echoes into eternity. So let's pray right now, pray for our week, and we'll keep praying. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for your words. Father, I thank you for the sacrifice that you gave for us in place of us, and we give because you first gave. Father, I pray that you would draw near us this week as we lean our lives against you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you so much for joining us for Victory On Demand. Here at Victory, we believe that we all have a next step and we pray that God uses what you've experienced here today to stir something in your life and to lead you to the next step in your faith journey, whatever that may be. If you'd like to talk to someone about taking your next step, please let us know by clicking the button that's popping up on your screen right now. Here at Victory, we're contributors, not just consumers. And we consider it a privilege to give back what God has so freely given to us. We celebrate generosity in the work that God does through our sacrificial giving in our community and around the world. If your experience today has helped you or blessed you in any way, we invite you to partner with us financially in our vision of connecting people back to God by going to victorycc.life slash give. Again, if you haven't experienced a live victory service yet, we invite you to visit victorycc.life for more information on when and where you can join us in person or online. Remember, here at Victory, we don't just go to church. We are the church everywhere we go. We'll see you next time.